pick an assignment, a diagnosis that's near and dear to you. Could have been you had asthma, your brother had asthma, or somebody has diabetes, or something you want to learn more about. Mm -hmm. Those are those conditions that you're going to learn about. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's actually will benefit from you. Just a mm -hmm. short little 250 word paper. Make sure you mm -hmm. do not plagiarize because it goes through a plagiar checker. Number mm -hmm. two, you're going to do an assessment, which I sent a word document on the announcements. It's easier than trying to work with a PDF. Okay. So it was just the same thing, but it, I put it in the Word document so you can save and you can write on it, okay? And then the okay. third thing is some sort of teaching, whether it is a uh, PowerPoint. I don't need mm -hmm. a lot of slides. Five or six slides can tell me all I need to know. Teach me something. Tell me what I need to know. What do I need to avoid? How do I keep myself healthy? You know, what should I eat? How should I exercise? How to give a medication? Whatever you want to do, teach me something about that diagnosis, okay? And it's just those three components and they all go through a plagiar checker. If it's students who wanna take a PowerPoint off the internet, don't do it, it'll be checked. So I'll know about it. And I, I won't have to say, well, you need to turn something else in. Now I do check all of these beforehand and I will tell you where your weakness is so that you all can get to it <laughs> possible. So if you will turn it back in after I give you something, you guys can score a perfect hundred, okay? Just, you know, wait for what I'm telling you. You know, Kim, I'll do yours today so that you have it. Um, and there's others that I've already been doing. So, you know, what's already been sent up is there. Thank you. And Thank you're you. Very, 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 very welcome. Not a problem. <clears throat> so today, you know, yes, talking about assignments, what's due. There's a lot of assignments that are due um, this week. Remember, we have the Calculate with Confidence that's due. We have Diabetes Case Study that's due. Um, NCLEX questions. Um, your pediatric uh, assignment exam, I'm going to get that reloaded for you so we can get that done. And then the pediatric assessment. Now, when you get to Kaplan, and you see pediatric math, it is called advanced math peds, big capital letter A. It's written differently. We changed it because it switched last semester. They changed the name again on me. So it is called advanced math pediatric A. So when you're looking for it, that's the one because I've had, it's the only one that's there, but students will ask, it's fine. So now you know. So we're gonna be GIGU today. Um, let me put in the chat box the handout in case you didn't get it so you can follow along. It is a great handout. It is a um, matching that um, I do. Uh, I made it uh, when I was on ground, actually, I made it as a quiz for one of them, uh, one of my classes. And then I realized it was just a really good learning tool. So let me just have it out there so you can have it. So those are your questions and I'll send you the, um, when I upload one of the videos or something, I'm gonna give you the answer. So you'll have the answer to that sheet just to be sure that you were correct, okay? But if you look at the matching, what that sheet is and you go through GIGU, everything that you're seeing GIGU is gonna be on that matching sheet. So if you're understanding what that says, you're good. If you don't, go back to the book. Look at what it says again, maybe that will help you or go back to the PowerPoint or, you know, my lesson. Okay, so here we go. Let's go up to our PowerPoint and get her going today. So GIGU, you're going to be surprised. There are a lot of things that happen with children that don't happen with adults. So this is one of those ones that really is specific um, to children, especially GI. Now, when you think of GU, you think of urine, you, you think of <clears throat> urinary tract infections. I mean, little girls get it because there's little tiny little urethras and we're wiping the wrong way, you know, potty training part of it. Um, then you have the infant boys. When they have this uh, tight foreskin called a phimosis, which is P-H-I-M-O-S-I-S, -I -I phimosis, a tight foreskin, and you can't pull it down, inside there's this cheese-like substance that forms called schmegma. 
And that is like a Petri dish for bacteria. So if we're not cleaning it, the incidences of uncircumcised boys of getting more um, urinary tract infections than usual is, is that's the reason. So girls is the tiny little ones and little urethras and then the boys when they're uncircumcised, very much a higher incidence of them. So how do we know if they have a urinary tract infection? They, they can't tell you, um, infants can't tell you, but when you start to see that child who is already potty trained, who's now incontinent, can't make it, you know, um, and you see that their underwear has urine stains in it, something's going on. Um, also the smell is a telltale sign. Or if you see them running back and forth, back and forth, sometimes, you know, kids, they sort of bounce back and forth and they hold themselves in the private parts, you know, that's a telltale sign. Something's going on. There is something that's bothering them. And, you know, sometimes you could see irritation down there, redness, especially in a little girl, you'll see redness and irritation. And then what do we do for that? <clears throat> well, we want to, number one, try to prevent urinary tract infections. And we can do that by as simple as increasing fluids on a child. That's, that's always number one. Keep it flowing, keep it moving. But then, of course, you know, hygiene, taking baths, making sure that area is clean. Um, as they're potty training, tell them how to go from front to back because, you know, E. coli is the biggest carrier of germs in the urinary tract system because it comes from the rectum, poof, right there. It goes in and it happens all the time. Um, as adolescents having frequent urinary tract infections, a question we might ask, are you sexually active? And if they are, tell them, I don't have to agree or not agree with sex as an adolescent, you know, it's their choice. You know, I would like to tell all girls shouldn't, but for who the heck am I? My daughter did what she wanted and I did what I wanted. And, you know, we can't stop the behavior, but we can tell them to urinate immediately after sex. And that will help prevent urinary tract infections or decrease the frequency of them. So we have this kid who's bouncing around, you smell the urine, we know something burning, they're telling you it hurts. Okay, go to the doctor. We're gonna be doing a urine culture and sensitivity. Now in an infant, you know, it was off the exam for the variations in nursing care. Um, we do urinary catheterizations on infants. If we do a bag, we're collecting the germs from, you know, inside the vaginal lips or uh, uncircumcised male inside, you know, the, um, the, the schmegma that's in there. We're, we're getting that, not urine. So to get the best um, specimen, which will really show us what it's growing and what antibiotics work is to do a catheterization. I know parents don't like it. They think their girls are being divergenized. I know males watching their little sons get catheterized. They're like, ooh, and they're twinging because they feel like we're putting that tube, you know, in them and no, we're not. But it's uncomfortable for a second and then it's done. And if you use good distraction features, the child is barely knows it's been done, okay? It can be done that way. And I've done that my career especially when I was working in an emergency room, I did a lot of urinary catheterizations on the little ones. Now, if they're premature, we don't have things small enough to go in them to get a calf. So we do a suprapubic aspiration. So right above the pubis bone, okay, there is an area right there is the, the a bladder. So we clean the area and have sterile gloves, use a needle, go directly down and take a half a cc is all you really need that's just gonna be enough for a culture. It's not gonna have all the other, you know, uh, specific gravity, protein, WBCs. No, but it can show a good culture. And we do that on the premature children. Most premature children are intubated, so they are on some sedation. So it's not as bad as it sounds. Sometimes as we're seeing that it's the kidneys that are really um, the culprit of these infections, we can do kidney taps. Um, we also can look at a bladder washout, which is we put a catheter in and we flush it with fluids and withdraw that liquid and see what sediment was in there. And if that grows any sort of infections, ultrasounds can show if it's structurally something wrong, is there a stricture somewhere? It could be one side, both side, one urethra, could be a valve, could be anywhere. 
in the kidneys, ureters, to the bladder. It could be anywhere in there. And then voiding urethrography is absolutely done when um, you have a young child, you know, three or four years old now, chronic urinary tract infections, you know, the bowels are moving well, because that's another thing they look at. Bowels are moving well, you know, they're wiping the right way, they're doing everything right, what's wrong. And this is a really deep explanation, um, exploration of putting dye with a catheter, a Foley catheter into the bladder and watch how the dye, does it go up and down? Is there reflux going on to try to help this child prevent future urinary tract infections? And then IVP is usually used on older children and it's usually for kidney stones. So I mentioned a renal biopsy or we can do a punch in them. And what we're doing is we're looking to see what sort of tissue, what infection can be in there. This is a procedure where the child will be kept NPO. Uh, smaller kids will be less hours than older children. Uh, you don't wanna keep you know, a child under one more than two to three hours NPO because they drop their blood sugar so quickly. So nothing to eat or drink for, let's say four to six. We're gonna give them something, some sort of medicine to keep them calm. Usually like a midazolam, Versed. It's a great thing that we do use, it helps. Um, we're gonna get it ready. We're gonna have vital signs before the procedure. Um, we're hitting a kidney and kidneys can cause hypertension, right? So let's just make sure that we have everything covered here. Now, when it's done, very similar to a cardiac calf post-op. We're gonna have a pressure dressing over the kidney. We're gonna make sure there's no drainage, which would be mostly urine. Sometimes it's blood, but mostly urine. So if we can put a sandbag there, it would be good. Bed rest 24 hours, just like cardiac calf. Now, because we've gone into the abdomen, into the kidney, we're gonna make sure that that kidney is not leaking within the peritoneal cavity. So if there is abdominal pain, tenderness, ooh, we're suspicious it's going inside because that urine will you know, um, cause an irritation. Also, we'll be really closely watching intake output. We really wanna see what does that urine look like? Are, is the output keeping what it should be? And on tinier kids, it's a bigger incision so they can get in and really see because everything's so close, they've really got to make sure that they're into the kidneys. So as I said, sometimes it's an obstructive uropathy. It could be reflux back into the kidneys. It could be a ureter that's kinked. The valves aren't working at the vesicle ureteral junction, which means the bladder vesicle. It's the vesicle that holds the urine, bladder. The ureters that are attached to, there's little sphincters. Sometimes they don't work good and you see reflux. Now, the bladder, yeah, it's sterile, but it's so close to the outside, there's chances of that urine not being as quote clean as it should. So if that's refluxing up the ureters back into the kidneys, it can cause a lot of problems. So this is the picture of you in your book. It shows you the different areas. We know hydronephrosis can occur. And we know that any valve area can cause problems with an obstructive. Could be one side, both sides. And a lot of times it could just be these fibrous bands that, you know, during, you know, um, their pregnancy and their bodies are, are developing, some little band gets, you know, stuck around it and it's, you know, makes like a stenotic area. And sometimes as the child gets bigger, it then occludes it completely. So these fibrous bands are actually pretty common. Now, nephrotic syndrome is not renal failure. It has nothing to do with renal failure, okay? Nephrotic syndrome has to do with the body's inability to retain protein. It loses protein, 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 protein. Now, when your blood vessels are depleted of the albumin, which is protein, it becomes more of a uh, state where the fluid tends to go interstitially and then the body becomes swollen and edematous. So 
hypoalbuminemia. That means no proteins in the blood. So be careful on your medications because they're going to get toxic quickly. Then it's the uh, protein urea. You're going to see four plus protein in the urine and it's going to look like a glass of beer like that right there. That could be the color of the urine with that foam. That's the protein you would see hyperlipidemia. And the big thing is swelling, this edema. You're going to see like swelling around the eyes. You could see even swelling in the mouth. Sometimes there's so much swelling and soreness in the mouth, they can't eat these nephrotic syndrome. So I'm telling you a lot about swelling, swelling, swelling. How are we going to take care of these children? Well, as I said, they're swelling. We are going to, how do we monitor that as a nurse? Well, intake, output, daily weights. That's what we're going to monitor. As the child, what are we going to teach them? Well, because you already are swollen, we're going to limit fluids and limit salt intake, right? Because you're already swollen, we don't want to add more swelling to swelling. These children are immunosuppressed. You have to be very careful with infections with them. And the family needs to understand the reasons for no salt, decreased fluids, especially brothers and sisters. Now, I came from a family with six brothers, and they used to tease me about anything they possibly could. You know, so if we can have my brothers understand why, 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 you know, maybe I would get half the teasing, not all the teasing like I used to. And it does take an adjustment in the family, adjustment in foods that are eaten, you know, trying to avoid those high salty foods for that one child or have a special dinner for that child during that time. So how do we take care of it? Well, number one, we need to support this child and let them understand. You understand how hard it is to reduce salt and how hard it is to decrease fluids and you know, commend them on taking their weight every day um, and monitoring how many times they're going to bathroom every day because these are those telltale signs that are telling you something's going on. I need to do something here. So again, these children can get you know, infections quickly, good hand washing always, especially for the family also. And again, strict I and O daily weights because this is a fluid problem. So acute glomerular nephritis, remember I told you there's two diagnoses in pediatrics that can be caused by a strep infection. Well, we know rheumatic fever, right? Well, guess what the second one is? acute glomerular nephritis, another one due to a strep infection. Same thing, you know, about two to three weeks after they've had it. And what will we see? Well, they'll stop urinating. You're not urinating, you're gonna swell. And you're not urinating, swelling, your blood pressure is gonna go up. And because of this oliguria, what comes out is so super concentrated, you will see proteinuria and you'll see hematuria with it. So. Can we reverse this? Oh yes, we can reverse this just as easily as we did rheumatic fever. It does take time in order to do it. We give steroids to these children and that's what helps them along with the diet. So corticosteroids, diet of low salt, monitoring fluids um, is what we need to do for these children. So these children, um, once they've gotten glomerular nephritis due to a strep, usually it won't happen again. You know, and a lot of parents like to hear that because this is scary. Their blood pressures are off the chart. You know, they're not urinating and they're very concerned and worried. Plus that word glomerular nephritis, it just sounds really horrible. So to tell them it's usually once and it's gone. And I think that's, you know, what they want to hear. So again, how do we manage it? We have edema, swelling daily weight, I and O. And the other thing is abdominal girth measurements. This is in the abdomen. This is about the kidney. So we always wanna look for the abdomen if it's growing or that tenderness. Again, low sodium, fluid restriction and careful with infections. I mentioned hemolytic uremic syndrome. It's an uncommon one, but it has to do with anemia, thrombocytopenia and your uh, renal failure. So this is a child who's not urinating hardly at all. And they have thrombocytopenia, P, platelets, decreased platelets, decreased platelets. What do we watch out for? 
bleeding, right? Any child with decreased platelets, thrombocytopenia, well, you know, that's a no brainer because we see P platelets, but any child, low platelets, we're gonna be concerned about bleeding. So these children, we're gonna see blood in their urine. And that's usually what we see. And then of course, with the thrombocytopenia, the rashing, bleeding, nose, mouth, anywhere could be involved with it too. The only thing that's the difference with this is we're going to see that urine, no urine. And that's going to key us into that it's not just an ITP sort of thing, that this is also a lot more involved. Because now we have BUN creatinins climbing and uh, urine output dissipating. So Wilms tumor is a kidney tumor. We've been through it before, ages three to five, mostly males, African-American. We do radiation surgery or chemo radiation surgery. And we know the big thing is leave that belly alone. Don't touch it. I know you wanna see it's the size of a softball, but it's so fragile that pieces can break off into the abdomen, into the peritoneum, and then it's quote, metastasized. Children do get renal failure, either acute or chronic. You know, acute, something happened. You know, maybe it was one of those blockage that blocked off a kidney, which caused kidney damage, or maybe it's chronic, it's born with a congenital abnormality. So acute renal failure, what do we see? Well, this is all of a sudden oliguric, which means your kid is urinating really well. All of a sudden they stop urinating, something's wrong. Now, I wanna stress that one of the things that causes acute renal failure in children is dehydration. That's why when we have children in sports, we have children you know, um, out in the sun, they should be drinking, drinking, drinking. Dehydration can really hurt a child a lot. A kid with uh, vomiting and diarrhea, you know, treating them quickly instead of waiting. I've seen children vomit twice and be severely dehydrated. And then I've seen other children vomiting for 12 hours, they still aren't dehydrated. So make sure that we give fluids to these children. And we're gonna go into that when we get to GI. Chronic renal failure is something that happens, the kidney wasn't born right, and now it's deteriorating as it goes along. And we call this uremia um, because we're just decreasing. We have some urine, and, but then it continually goes you know, lower and lower. <clears throat> Now, chronic renal failure could be due to that malformation, which, you know, is not correctable. That reflux, like I talked about, could kill kidneys. Um, and I've seen hereditary. Now, I did do a clinical for another a college on the GU floor at Nicholas Children's Hospital, and they had a dialysis unit. And I was like, wow, there are a lot of kids on dialysis. I said, why? What is that one thing that causes children to have dialysis? And I'm telling you, many nurses that I asked all said it was intermarriages, marrying first uh, cousins in some cultures. So it does reflect, you know, with, you know, medical things that go on with their children. So I was like, okay. Um, also, chronic infections, pyelonephritis, I mean, that pyelonephritis is like a severe infection up into the kidneys, which of course can damage it. Uh, chronic lamellar nephritis, if you're not going to correct it, it, it can cause damage. And then lupus, it kills any organ. So why not the kidney? Yeah, the kidney, it'll attack too. And then of course, anaphylactoid purpura goes in, it will damage kidneys. And now you have a chronic renal failure child. So how are we going to take care of this child? Well, we know somehow we need to extract the waste products out of the body. We know that. So we need to try to get the kidney working as best as it can, keep those electrolytes and fluids where they should. Now, if you've ever noticed or pay attention now, any child or adult who has chronic renal failure, you're going to see a low hemoglobin hematocrit. Um, because they don't make red blood cells that well in this disease. So giving erythropoietin can help decrease, let's say 
if they're getting, you know, um, blood transfusions every three, four months, well, maybe we can stop giving one of those infusions because we're having the body work for itself, which is absolutely the best thing to do, you know, and it gives that kid a chance, you know, to live life a lot more than they sh the way that they should. You know, any kid, any disease, we want them to try to be as normal as possible within what they can do. I mean, that's the goal. They're still a kid. You know, kids deserve to be children. Now there's another type of dialysis. We're using it a lot more in adults today. Um, it's usually the starting out point with dialysis with many adults and it's peritoneal dialysis. Um, in the young child, they cannot be on hemodialysis. You can put in those vessels, you know, the AV canal thing, but that swooshing of blood that comes in and out with dialysis can rupture the brain vessels and cause intraventricular hemorrhages. So you can't put them on hemodialysis. They must be on peritoneal dialysis. And it's a pretty neat thing. What's so good about this? Now, this is another, this is one tube here that you can see. Now, this is how you would have it at home and how you would, when you're done, fix it up and have it for the day. You might put a net around to hold the tube from being pulled or stick it inside the diaper so that it's not pulled on. But it's a catheter that goes inside the abdomen. And what the nephrologist does, according to lab works, they will give you a warmed, uh, they'll give you a solution. We call it a diastolate, okay? It's some sort of mixture of electrolytes or fluids or sugars, it's whatever they decide. And there is a warming tray, literally this silver warming tray that you put this big bag of fluid on. And we spike that bag, this warm, put it through tubing and with sterile technique, we'll hook it up to the child. The reason why we do sterile technique is the only thing we have for a kidney on this child is their abdomen, their belly, their peritoneum. If we get that infected, there's nothing we can do because we need that peritoneal cavity to be able to filtrate, you know, the waste products for this child. Okay. So prevention of peritonitis is huge. Do everything we can. Now, as a nurse, as we're watching peritoneal dialysis, the thing about this is we can send children home with it. My little Willie had um, peritoneal dialysis at home. He was amazing and the mother was beyond amazing. She could put a dressing back on that child as good as I could, if maybe not better. I hate to say that because I'm pretty OCD, but she would have this child set up with the net on, things right, never ever got infected. And I believe he was two and a half where he got his kidney. So um, we saved his belly for all of that time. And I think that's commendable. And they'll hook him up at night. Now, how do we do per peritoneal dialysis? So you've got this warm solution, you put it through this machine and it will put a certain quantity into the abdomen and then the machine stops. So it stills, it sits inside for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever the physician says. Then it goes into the drain mode and it will drain into a Foley catheter. And in that Foley catheter, it's a drain for another 20, 30 minutes. And you may do this cycle eight, 10 times a night. And the difference between the fluid you put in and what was there in the Foley catheter is your urine output. And it's actually very accurate. Um, if we are doing peritoneal dialysis, our responsibility is to look for abdominal pain. That's and maybe redness around the site. Maybe that's telling us we're getting peritonitis. Okay. Also a change in the color of the fluid, or maybe all of a sudden you're seeing a lot of debris coming out. Something doesn't look right. When in doubt, call the, the healthcare provider and get antibiotics started now because you need to save that belly, priority care that belly. And when they manage it at home, they do well. One of my best girlfriends who was a nurse with me uh, when she retired, found out she was in renal failure, maybe from holding her urine like we do as nurses for 40 some odd years. 
So she went home on peritoneal dialysis and I was helping her get it set up um, and worked with machine. And I was peritoneal dialysis certified. So I was helping her with it and she loved it because she did it at night and during the day she could do whatever she wanted. So it's used in both fields, peds and um, adults. So what best describes acute glomerular nephritis? What is it? E. E. Yep, it's your streptococcal infection, rheumatic fever and acute glomerular nephritis. And we can cure it and it can go away. If it's not caught quick enough, it could be a chronic condition. So now we're gonna go into GI and there are a lot of different GI diagnoses that have little telltale signs that you look for. So I'm gonna go over them. So the GI system, especially the small bowel is where we put you know, different things from the common bile duct, your liver, your gallbladder, your pancreas, all get into the food to try to digest it and take the vitamins and absorb it into the body. There are times like as in cystic fibrosis, right? You can't absorb any of your fat soluble and we're gonna to get to celiac. Again, fat soluble vitamins. We really need to um, watch that and then make sure that these children and parents know they need to follow lab levels and maybe they need to be on some sort of vitamin to help them absorb what they do need. So nutritional disorders are, do uh, occur. Now we know children are constantly growing. If you don't have nutrition, 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 what happens? Well, it's gonna be some decreased cognition for sure. And also it's gonna be that growth failure. The kid's gonna be smaller. So nutrition, nutrition, again, so important. And it comes from those children who can't absorb properly too. Food allergies, we know that children do have food allergies. We don't really start seeing them most of the time, except for lactose intolerance. We don't see them till about six months where we start adding on foods. You could have a rash this big. I mean, that's a great thing. Sometimes it's constipation, diarrhea. Sometimes it's a little bit of rash underneath the chin or in the bends of the arms or behind the knees. It's not as evident as all of that. And you know what I would say to a parent, write down what you saw when you um, offer it again, see if you see the same thing. Um, and remember there's intolerances and then there's allergies. Some intolerance would be constipation, too much gas, diarrhea. Those are, you know, could be an intolerance. The allergy is when you see some sort of response. Usually it means, could even be difficulty breathing. Um, lactose intolerance, that starts in the beginning where we're giving milk, especially those that are gonna be on formulas that we have to change it to a non-milk product. We have soy and Nutramagen. We've got all different products today to feed those children. So GI dysfunctions can be a little bit of everything, but we know if a child is eating and spitting up, they're losing calories, they're losing nutrition. You lose nutrition, what happens? Cognition and growth failure. Um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation can all occur. Um, you can see children with abdominal pain, distension, bleeding. If something is going on in the common bile duct and the liver, we're gonna see jaundice, biliary atresia. That's the big one um, that you just all of a sudden see a kid starting to look yellow and then you start looking for what's going on. Children are born with the inability to, to, to chew and swallow, dysphagia. Um, this is really um, evident in a diagnosis called Pierre Robin. Um, it has a couple other thing that goes with it, but one of them is this little tiny little chin and they don't have that ability to swallow well and they choke on their food. As they get older, they put a G-tube in those children. And then as they get older, the children are learned, um, are taught again how to eat by their mouth and they do actually do well. And remember fever loses fluid. Losing fluid uh, happens to these children with fever because you know their temperatures are higher. Body is trying to get rid of the fever. And remember, you're losing fluid. You could go to dehydration with just a fever. So again, with a fever, we should give fluids to this child. 
Dehydration. Now, before we even look at the slide, look at this infant. Do you see the color of this infant? And do you see that fontanelle sunken? That, that's sunken you know, down to their neck as far as I'm concerned. And the color of this infant is so pale. The ears and even the nose are not pink at all. This child, uh, the next thing I would do is listen to the heart rate and see if their heart rate was elevated at rest. This kid looks like it's not crying or anything, just sitting there and that fontanelle's low. That kid is dehydrated. We could see the front, probably eyeballs are sunken in the head because they do get sunken in their head like that. So what is dehydration? It's when output is far beyond what goes in. Um, it could be insensible, it could be that fever, sweating. Um, it could be the kidneys just put out more. Um, or it could be due to vomiting and diarrhea. And we're going to go into how to treat them into the cahoots really, really closely so you'll understand it. Ketoacidosis causes dehydration. That's why we give a bolus of normal saline to diabetic ketoacidosis, right? And then, of course, burns. Anytime you get rid of skin, you're, you're getting rid of fluid. So accurate measuring of intake and output. Um, there's always questions on what do you measure for output. Urine, stools, vomit. And, and vomit most of the time could be an estimation, because, or like a guesstimation. Um, you didn't always catch the whole thing. Even sweating. But there are children with profuse sweating that you need to have some sort of measurement. So you could put like a chucks underneath them and then measure the chucks before and after and still get a guesstimation of the sweat. I mean, that's going to the nth degree. I've never had to go to that far, but it can be done. And then of course, capillary refill, skin turgor, fontanelles, that's absolutely we would be looking at. And then if we're watching their weights, we're watching them, you know, um, losing weight, gaining weight, we're either gaining or losing, you know, fluid, okay? And then of course, are they awake and alert? Or are they getting drowsy and hard to arouse? Because dehydration will make a kid lethargic. Children get all types of diarrhea from we don't know why to um, this infectious gastroenteritis. And it's just diarrhea happens in children. So how do we take care of diarrhea? Well, I'm gonna reiterate this in the cahoots. You're gonna see a lot of examples. You're gonna to have to choose your answer. But with diarrhea, our big goal is to replace the fluids and electrolytes. So an electrolyte solution, Pedialyte, Gatorade, Powerade, one of those things. If they're having diarrhea, you feed the child. You have the child drink. They're not vomiting. They still have their mouth. You do not have to just give liquids because then their stool is going to be all liquids. So we will introduce the diet, low fat, not spicy. So you're going to go to the doctor. You have diarrhea. He's going to say, okay, give him some Pedialyte, start with some crackers. You know, there used to be that brat diet years ago. That's not a bad choice. Bananas, rice, applesauce, toast. We don't tell them that as per se, but those are really great choices to give parents because if you give them food, there's something to tighten up to stop the diarrhea. They also probably will give them some sort of probiotic. That's the trick. They'll give them probiotics because you've lost a lot of the flora and they wanna replace it. Children do get constipated for many reasons, could be diet. We know that in constipation, there's more constipation with formula than there is breast milk. Um, we also know that children, it's the only thing they can control is their stool. So you will see children not stooling for seven, 10 days. And if you do an x-ray of their belly, the descending transverse and ascending colon is all white and full of stool. And you're like, oh my God, this kid must really hurt. When this happens, you need to think, What's going on with this child? What emotional stress is happening? Did they just move from another town? Did grandma die? Did um, their dog run away? I mean, it could be anything. A lot of it will show up with, with showing constipation. 
Remember also with constipation, if your child is constipated, they are also apt to get multiple urinary tract infections. We need to keep that stool moving and soft several times a day, and that's where it should be. That's one thing parents never think of. There's no correlation, and there's a huge correlation between stool and urine. Now, we've talked about it a little bit, being constipated, no stool, the first day, day and a half after birth. We've already said it could be hypothyroidism, so we'll measure for that. Then we went and said, oh, it can be CF, right? Cystic fibrosis. We're going to go into Hirschsprung's next. And remember, if there's a tightening or no opening, that, of course, can also um, stop them from stooling. So I mentioned constipation, breastfed versus formula. We know formula, they tend to be more constipated. What do we do? We just keep feeding them. Sometimes a physician will add medications depending on the severity of the constipation. Um, some of them will have them maybe put a juice in there earlier, but that's up to every you know, pediatrician. They all do things a little bit differently. Now, this is the other thing, Hirschsprung's disease that causes no stool in the first 24 to 36 hours. And the only stool you may see looks like you put icing in a little um, thing that you squeeze out and you letter a cake with, and you see that little ribbon looking thing. If you look at the bottom of this picture, the point to the rectum, that it just squirts out there just a little bit. That big area has no nerves, has no peristalsis. It sits there, it's non-functional, but sometimes enough gets in there that it pushes, you might see a little ribbon-like stool come out, okay? This is uh, something that we need to go ahead and diagnose. We'll do an X-ray. You know, because sometimes you can feel the stool in the belly or you can see that big outpatching. And um, we'll see that anywhere from birth up to a couple months later, but usually they catch it pretty well at birth. And they need to go in, take a biopsy, and in the biopsy will show no nerves. And when there's no nerves, they will remove that area of rectum and create a colostomy. That colostomy will be there for up to the first year of life, and then they will reconnect it. Sometimes it's two to three months later, sometimes it's more, it all depends on the child. But once that's out, once we reconnect it, these children do well. Now, vomiting in children is normal. They all spit up, right? But what if they're vomiting because, you know, they caught the stomach bug and they're just vomiting, vomiting? Now, if we are seeing them vomiting all their food, how are we going to take care of this? And you're going to hear them retching and vomiting. I mean, there's nothing worse than seeing a child less than one years old just <laughs> and you just don't know <laughs> poor little things. Now, they're vomiting. And if they continue to vomit and they're not stopping, remember dehydration. We don't want them to get dehydrated. So this child, because they're vomiting and they're not stopping, requires an intravenous. Remember, diarrhea will feed by mouth because they're holding the food down. If they're vomiting, no, especially the younger kids, we will get an IV in them. And because we stuck a needle in a vein, we're going to uh, also make sure that we get an electrolyte, a metabolic profile, seeing where their potassium is. And we will be giving fluids as needed, 10 to 20 milligram, uh, milliliters per kilogram. Uh, kilogram. And remember, we never bolus with sugar ever, ever, ever. We only bolus with normal saline, okay? How would we know that all of a sudden the dehydration's reversed? Well, if the heart rate was 160 before and it's now 110, guess what? It worked. You will see it that quickly. You'll listen to that heart rate. And you, if we had it up on a monitor, you'd be watching as we bolus that fluid and the heart rate coming down. A lot of things that happen in infants is, you know, could be reflux, uh, gastroesophageal reflux, GERD. 
GERD is very common in children, but remember, they're losing a lot of calories. And if it becomes a chronic condition that we can't control, that the child's being burped properly, sitting up afterwards, you know, um, that this child's been started on Pepsid or a medicine, try to hold these foods down, nothing's working. Um, after this med medical try, they will suggest they, this child go for a Nissan fundal plication. And we use this a lot when we put a G-tube in, a gastrostomy tube. The gastrostomy tube, our goal is just to dump the feeding down and go, not a continuous feed. So it's a big quantity and we don't want it refluxing and aspirating into the lungs. So with this, we take the portion, the top portion of the stomach and wrap it over the esophagus. So now you cannot reflux. It's called a Nissan fundal plication. It's that treatment when nothing else works for GERD. Acute appendicitis. Well, signs, symptoms, everything just like adult, right? Lower quadrant. You know, you'll have uh, seven, eight-year-old boys coming in, holding the right groin, bending over and limping on the right leg. And you're like, appendix. It's very easy to see, especially one that's in pain. Now, if they're in pain, they go to surgery. We make them NPO, start an IV, get them to surgery. They do laparoscopic and they're usually home the next day. Um, it's a, a easier surgery. Now, if they stop hurting, possibly that appendix has burst and that creates peritonitis, which creates a new scenario. A child who has peritonitis has had that area between the small intestines and large intestines has bursted and has put this toxic waste into the peritoneum. And this intestines are now angry because it burns and it hurts and it swells. So we need to rest that intestine. So NPO. Number two, an NG tube to prevent any secretions that you're always swallowing. Your stomach is always making secretions. Get rid of that so that we can rest those intestines. We're going to be given IVs, IV antibiotics. This kid, because it's post-op and we want that bowel to start moving up out of bed, walking as we can with that NG tube in, okay? And because it burst in the peritoneum, who knows if the skin that they attached together and they closed that wound, that surgical wound, was it healthy tissue? We don't know. So check that incision site out because it could dehiss on you. This would be one that could dehiss that all of a sudden you're looking at intestines when you check, you know, underneath the bandage. So that's acute appendicitis with peritonitis. Mechal diverticulum is a fetal mesenteric duct. What does that mean? Well, these like little skin tabs that have a vessel in it, have some sort of blood supply. It's like a little skin tab that goes inside the intestines. Sometimes for whatever reason, they rip off and there's no nerves in them. They don't hurt, but that vessel is there just bleeding, 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 bleeding. So what do you see? Painless rectal bleeding. You're not going to see a belly um, hurting anywhere. You're going to see this painless rectal bleeding. What they need to do is go to surgery and just remove that diverticulum. They need to tie it off and they do really well. It's just this rectal bleeding. And again, you're not going to see any pain with it. IBS, inflammatory bowel disease, mouth to anus, anywhere in between. That's what we consider it. We do have specific ones, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and those are your segmented areas. And how do we treat IBS? Well, most of the time IBS we treat with diet and we treat with steroids. Um, if it becomes so ulcerative and um, now it's almost you know, perforating the bowel, they need to go in and do surgical treatment. They need to remove that segment of bowel um, to prevent that from happening. But nutrition and um, steroids is needed is what these children need to, to help them. 
children do get peptic ulcer diseases. I've had little six-year-old boys uh, and the parent says he's just a little worry wart. He worries about everything and um, has an ulcer, a um, lot of pain in the, in the abdomen. Same treatment as we would with an adult. Put him on some Pepsid, change his diet, uh, maybe some Mylanta or Maalox, whatever the physician likes, something to help keep that stomach as calm as possible. And of course, find out why he's so stressed all the time. And if we do perforate, and sometimes these also get so big, they might have to do a partial gastrectomy. I've never seen it on a kid, but I can see the possibilities of it happening. Problems with the liver, acute or chronic, could be from a virus, not a virus, could be autoimmune, metabolic. Um, the thing that we need to know about hepatitis is that if a child has hepatitis, we need to know what should this child eat? You know, what is the diet for this child? And because of their not, you know, um, ingesting and they're not able to tolerate fats uh, because the liver, no bile, we, we're not going to, you know, digest fats. We want a diet high in protein and carbohydrates. It keeps the calories there for energy. And then it also, protein helps with the muscle wasting so that these children can maintain good muscle tone. And then we don't want uh, fat uh, because abdominal distension and a lot of gas. So a low fat diet for these children. So regarding the mouth, we have cleft lip, cleft palate, one side, both side, one with a palate, one without, two with just the lip, no palate or everything. Um, these children are born um, and these are the pictures out of your book too, you can see them. And it's a lot of um, things go on with a parent who gets a child with a cleft lip. Now they cannot put a seal around a bottle or a breast in order to nurse, or in order to suck a bottle. So there's issues with uh, feeding them. This is why that lip is closed within the first two to three months of age. And it's important to pick a good surgeon so they approximate the lip so you don't have a crooked lip when they're done. That little silver thing there is called a Logan bow. And that's to prevent these kids from laying on their lip. And it also prevents them from trying to get to it. And if you look at those arms, there's elbow restraints on in order also to leave it alone, let it heal properly. So palate, palate is done. You'll see six to 12 months, eight to 12 months, the latter portion of you know, your infant time. That palate is open, so they hung like that if they were older, because they can't make a seal and make an M and they just can't. So they do fix this hopefully before the child starts to speak so that there's no problems with their speech development. Still gonna take some speech therapy because you know they're working through this palate um, and trying to um, make sounds that they never made, made before. Uh, but these kids do really well. Again, encourage them to talk, to coo, get into speech therapy, very important for these children. Now, as I said, with a cleft lips, hard with, uh, even in the palate, with feeding. Now, if it's a cleft lip and a palate, if we're feeding a child, this bottle here, when you turn it over, it puts formula closer to the nipple and it's very soft. And as you're holding the child up and you're feeding them, you, you just push a little bit and they're getting little bits of formula or breast milk in the back of their mouth and they're able to swallow it and do very carefully. If it's a palate too, you might see this milk come up their nose. There's no palate to stop it from coming out. Again, this was my Pierre Robin little boy, um, had no palate and but he didn't have a lip. So it was, okay, I've never seen just palate, but this one, it was a full soft hard palate gone. And he would feed through the nose. So um, I always had the pleasure of feeding him because they trusted me at this site because he was my little guy. 
And um, he did well, he did very well and had many things fixed up. And we're gonna tell you more things that he had. But in breastfeeding, um, some of them can breastfeed, but it takes a lot of patience by the mother. Remember, if they're not eating right, guess what happens? Decreased cognition, growth failure. So making sure they get enough food. And how do we know? Well, they're gaining weight and they have six to eight wet diapers a day, right? That's telling you they're getting their fluids. Those things in itself is all we need to tell parents. Now, at times connections or connections where they shouldn't be are formed. And esophageal, esophageal atresia means there is no passageway to the stomach. There is the mouth connected to esophagus, which goes nowhere, it's a blind pouch. Then there is what we call a tracheoesophageal fistula. So trach, and esophagus, has a fistula, a tube connecting. So if they swallow, guess where that food, that formula goes? Directly into the lungs. So how do you think we would take care of that? Well, we're gonna have that kid elevated in the bed, in a warmer, or the crib, whatever. And we are going to put them NPO. Anything that goes in the mouth is going directly in the lungs. Either of these things, we are not feeding this child. Because this child, sometimes we don't know or realize that this is going on. What we would see in a child with a not, you wouldn't suspect them to have this condition. They'd be choking and sputtering and mucus and <laughs> You know, they, because they can't do anything. And all they're doing is aspirating, aspirating their own mucus. So that would alert um, the nurse, hopefully, and the physician that maybe we need to go and do x-ray, see what's going on, or CAT scan, or GI, or whatever they determine they need to do um, in order to find out uh, where this connection or lack of connection is. These children, once we fix them, do well, they're a normal child. They're, it's not a condition, it's not a syndrome, it's just they're lacking a connection there. So we treat them and it has a bit elevated. We're gonna put them NPO, we'll have suction at the bedside and these children will be placed on IVs and antibiotics because they're always aspirating no matter what you do. They're always gonna aspirate into their lungs. So prevention of pneumonias, we're gonna be having them on antibiotics. So basically what I just said here, um, keep your airway open, watch out for that pneumonia and put the kid on IVs and antibiotics. And these kids once fixed do well, they usually wait a little while to fix them. So they're old enough, they're bigger, so they more to work on. Then we have hernias. I think the ones I like the most are the umbilical hernias. Um, I like to push them in and out. When they're nice and soft, push in and out, they're good they're healthy, they're not causing a problem. If you push on one, it's painful. This is an emergency. This child needs to go to the emergency room and will need surgery. It's probably an incarcerated or strangulated hernia. It means it's twisted. That means oxygen is cut off and we are at uh, on a time now to get that untwisted and to get oxygen uh, back to the area which is lacking it. One of the other um, hernias that I you know, really didn't even know before I went to newborn ICU is called a diaphragmatic hernia. And this is the diaphragm doesn't form. And the intestines during you know, fetal times inside mom, the intestines come up and take over the left lung area. So that left lung doesn't form and it pushes. So when the baby's born, they are respiratory compromised. They are extremely difficult to ventilate. And most of them end up on ECMO, which is like a heart lung machine in order to keep them alive. Then they'll take, bring down the intestines, put in a mesh, and then do a lot of respiratory care, but they'll only have one lung for life. Pyloric stenosis, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Well, there is a pyloric sphincter that connects the lower stomach to the small intestine, to the duodenum. 
and that sphincter gets thickened and muscular and it becomes narrowed to the point where milk can't go down. This infant is three weeks to two, three months and the food goes down, you feed them, you breastfeed them, you bottle feed them, the food goes down and a little bit later, all of a sudden, this kid will projectile across a room and will hit your feet 15 feet away. I mean, it is projectile. Um, they're like that little kid just threw it that far. It's quite impressive actually. We have GERD, which is a, just a, you know, a little bit of a dribble, but pyloric stenosis is forceful across the room. So what you would do is take and feel right in the middle of the upper chest and you're gonna feel this little olive. And it's that, that hypertrophic um, uh, pyloric valve and you can actually feel it there. So what do we do for this child? Well, when we see forceful across the room, number one, we're gonna say, please do not feed your child anymore because they're just gonna vomit again and we'll be concerned about aspiration, right? We're gonna do an ultrasound and it's going to show it. These children will get an IV and they will be sent to the OR and repaired. Postoperatively, they'll be fed clear liquids and then they will go home within a day or two. They do really well. And you know, remember this is a really young baby and these parents are like, oh my God, my little baby has to have surgery and they're really having a hard time. Just remember that, that they need a little bit of extra hugs. Intussusception is when the intestines suck in on itself like a telescope. It's easy to say, it telescopes in and it causes severe, severe abdominal pain. These kids, well, their legs will be moving back and forth. They'll be crying, they hurt. And it's most common, they say in ages three months to three years, the youngest I've ever seen is five months old. And it's usually one to three years old. That's that little spot where I see my, what, me and my career I have seen. And these children hurt. Now, we'll go in and do an ultrasound. If they're in pain, we're going to see it, uh, where this intussusception is. If there's, by the time it gets ultrasound, they are running around, they're not in pain, it's already come out by itself. So intussusception, you're going to see in the diaper some jelly-like um, bloody stool. That's what you see, a little bit of that. And um, if it you know, comes out by itself, self-resolving, then these children will go home and we'll tell them to have higher fiber in their diet. If that doesn't work and they're still, you know, ultrasound, they still have ultrasound, sometimes they'll need to go to radiology and have an air enema under fluoroscopy with a radiologist. And they literally pump, put a tube up the rectum and they pump it up and put the air there and it will pop open that intestines. And once it opens, that kid relaxes. It's just amazing from a moment of crying to a moment. And oh, it's like all of a sudden they fall asleep. They're so happy that the pain is gone. And if that doesn't work and they're just, you know, have to be too overly aggressive, we'll go to surgery and they'll remove that piece of intestine. So intussusception. Malrotation and vulvus has to do with things twisting around the intestines during embryolic, embryolic development, or it could have twisted like I've seen them in a knot before. And you really will see signs and symptoms like an appendix, but it's not the right lower quadrant. Usually it's like the left upper um, where, where I've seen them. And again, if we don't catch it, stool, it's gonna perforate the bowel. And again, peritonitis, same treatment as appendix. Then we have something called an imperforated anus, which means this baby, if you look at the picture, there's no anus. So there's no exit point for the GI tract. This child will immediately go for a colostomy and will have a colostomy because there's no anal sphincter. So this child um, 
it's an emergency to do surgery. Now, there are other things that happen to children where you'll see connections between the intestines and the bladder. Um, and you're going to see stool coming out as urine, or you might see stool coming out of the vagina, or you meet, might see urine coming out of the intestines. You'll see all different things. And as a nurse, as we are changing the diapers, it's things that we should notice that, you know, there's something wrong coming out of a wrong place so that we can tell the physician so we can get these corrected for them. Because usually they don't know. It's usually our eyes that they see. Celiac disease is that gluten problem. It is, has to do with fat malabsorption. You're going to see these pale, really malodorous, stinky, stinky, stinky stools. Um, and they're not getting proper nutrition as they should. Um, this is due, they get severe, severe abdominal pain rye, wheat, and barley. Um, they can't really have anything, I call it with flour, anything that's dipped in anything, unless it says gluten-free, they cannot have. So in a case with uh, celiac disease, you know, they can have, you know, dairy, they can have an uh, omelet, they can have cheese omelet, they can have, you know, a banana, and they can have milk, and they can have orange juice, you know, it's just anything that shows bread, noodles, pasta, no. And now short bowel syndrome. You know, babies are born with a normal bowel, and something happens where they've lost the bowel Usually, I've seen this in regards to something called necrotizing endocolitis or NEC. Now, infants are born and they have at times these hypoxic episodes, which could affect the bowels. So when we start to feed them, that area of bowel that had some hypoxemia, which isn't back to where it should be, gets food in there, gets overworked and it dies. And that's what that necrotizing means. Now, this is why when we have infants being fed, we are going to check their abdominal girth and it, every single feed. And if we are going to be giving tube feedings, we're going to make sure, is there an aspirate? If there is an aspirate and the abdominal girth is bigger, we're suspecting NEC. And we'll get the x-ray and take care of it. One girl of mine, Jessica. She was a cardiac also, so she had hypoxic episodes like crazy. She started having the symptoms and we ended up taking 58 centimeters of her small intestines out. So most of her absorption system was taken out and she was sent home looking like this boy, a G tube for day time. We would put frequent uh, small amounts of high calorie foods in there for her. And at night, they would hook her up to hyperallin lipids so to, for her to get her nutrition. She still, the last time I saw her, she was 18 and she still was really skinny, but she was now eating a lot more by mouth. And actually she was quite tall for um, uh, a young girl. So that's the biggest challenge is nutrition on these children because they don't have you know, the bowel in order to absorb it. You know, you see this gastroschisis. There, there's two diagnoses where children's insides are born on the outside. Gastroschisis is the stomach, born on the outside of the abdominal wall. The other one is your bladder, bladder extrophy, born on the outside. Now, they're still work, they're still connected, everything's good, but they're on the outside. Now, because they're born on the outside, we need to take care of that as in preventing infection because your insides are out, right? Just like you would be in surgery with a mask and sterile gloves, same thing for these children. And a surgeon comes in every day and sort of tries to make room, stuffs it in little by little until the point where they know they can put all of it in and then they will um, close them back up. It's a midline um, problem is what they call it. And then we know children, they'll eat anything. They'll put anything in their mouth. Most common thing is vitamins. Now, vitamin in itself doesn't harm, 
but if it's vitamins with iron, it can cause a lot of harms because too much iron is bad. Another one is Tylenol. Um, there are acetaminophen, the little tablets, they just love to chew them. Um, of course, then you worry about the liver. So with children, make sure that everything is hidden, uh, locked up, put away in a place where they can't climb, jump and get to it because you know children will do everything. Um, and again, call poison control, any questions. Uh, it's the first thing a triage nurse does is they call poison control. We know any sort of ingestion of anything. And that gives us the newest up-to-date information to treat the child the best we can. And then they call back to check up on the child, make sure the child's okay. And that's today. Any questions? No, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you, Isabel. How about a cahoot? So I, have a one, cahoot? I have one question. Can sure. I ask you one question? Oh, what man, did you Pam. say? Oh, stop. <laughs> um, the bladder outside the abdomen. Extra feet. It's called what? Extra feet. E X T R O P H Y. Extra feet. And an it extra works. Fee? It still works. Okay. You still put a diaper on the normal way. It still comes out the same way, but it's on the outside. Okay. Thank you. A stomach borne out, we wouldn't be feeding it until it gets back in, but they still, they work. It, it's quite a, a thing to see. All right, let me get you onto your cahoots. Here we go. You gonna win today, Lewis? Maybe. Oh, come on, you can do it. I know Kim's gonna try. And I know Isabel also is gonna try. You're really putting us on the spot, Professor Bogart. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> All right, let's get going. We're going to rate on time tonight. A multi select. All of the following are symptoms of dehydration in an infant. Dehydration. All of the following except. All of them are, and which isn't. <clears throat> so you would have a decreased urine output. If you're dehydrated, you're not urinating. You're gonna have elevated heart rate. You're gonna have a decreased blood pressure, dry skin. You're gonna be weak, lethargic, um, and you're gonna have prolonged capillary refill. This is just what you see with infants. And adults, you'll see the same things. What is priority treatment for a child with dehydration due to profuse vomiting? Profuse vomiting, what are you gonna do? So when you are vomiting, there's no way I'm giving you anything by mouth, okay? especially um, a younger child, we're not going to wait because dehydration is so dangerous. So we'll start an IV and we'll be getting that uh, chem profile to look at the electrolytes. What is a treatment for an infant with diarrhea lasting for four days? <clears throat> So diarrhea, we're going to be giving PO, okay? 
we're not going to start IV fluids because we don't need it. We have uh, somewhere we can give fluids. They're not vomiting. And again, we'll start with the electrolyte solution and we're going to give a diet so that we have something to make a stool, not just water. And then Kim went on fire, you see? What acid-base imbalance may you see with a child that is having profuse diarrhea? Now you're gonna see me adding these acid-base things because I know that HESI and NCLEX loves acid-base questions. So I'm just trying to get you used to them. If you don't understand them, let me know. I'll talk to you about them. <clears throat> so when you have diarrhea, you lose a lot of alkaline due to what comes out of the small intestines, okay? So you lose alkaline, you become acid. So metabolic acidosis. You would think vomiting, you're going to see acid come out. But diarrhea, you're, you're losing alkaline, okay? Important to remember. A multi-select. An infant has not passed the meconium stool in the first day, day and a half. What would you assess for? <clears throat> so, We've already talked about hypothyroidism and cystic fibrosis. And today we talked about Hirschsprungs because it's so squeezed at the bottom. Sometimes you don't see anything at all. An electrolyte imbalance has nothing to do with no stool, nothing. And Kim went back up top. Deficiency of vitamin D causes what? Vitamin D is rickets. Vitamin C deficiency is scurvy. What treatment can the nurse anticipate to a child unable to eat or drink anything with profuse vomiting and diarrhea? <clears throat> So if you're unable to drink or eat, you're giving IV fluids. IV fluids will be given and then anti-emetics like your Zofran or Dentstron. Um, and then slowly, we won't give water, we'll give sips of that Pedialyte or Powerade or Gatorade. <clears throat> a multi-select. What nursing management would you anticipate for a child with a ruptured appendix postoperatively? So the kid's appendix burst before they got to surgery. What are you gonna have to do for this child after surgery? So, they're going to be up and out of bed walking because we want the bowels moving. And that's how we get that bowels and peristalsis happening. So absolutely out of bed. NG tube suction to keep that bowel empty because it's angry and it's irritated. It's red, it's not feeling well. So nothing can go through it. IV antibiotics because it's an infection. And then because we don't know what that surgical site looks like, um, the skin underneath, we're going to be checking that to make sure it doesn't dehiss. Passage of urine usually at night in children who should have voluntary bladder control is called what? <laughs> So bedtime wedding is called enuresis. Now there's two things you need to know in this slide here, epispadius and hypospadius. 
sometimes when a boy baby is born, the urethra doesn't empty at the tip. It empties underneath, and that's called a hypospadias. The hole is on the bottom. And sometimes it's on top, and that's the epispadias, okay? What they do is they take the circumcised skin, and instead of just doing circumcision, they use that skin to repair wherever the defect is. Then they put the stint in there, like the small tube. It actually looks like a straight catheter um, tube, a little bit rigid, a little soft. Put it in there to keep that area open and rounded in there, okay? And the kids do well. We try to get that done before they're potty trained. So um, it's taken care of usually, you know, um, by the first year. And again, this was my little Pierre Robin guy. He had a hypospadias along with a cleft palate. He had a lot of things. <clears throat> what is Hirschsprung's disease? So Hirschsprung's disease is called the absence of parasympathetic ganglion cells. That just means there's no nerves in there. There's nothing that causes peristalsis. There is nothing, you know, that um, has nerves. So they don't feel it at all. What type of stools would an infant with Hirschsprung's disease have? Remember that big outpatching and close to the anus is very tiny and narrowed. I said, sometimes it looks like you should use those things that you use icing to write, you know, happy birthday on the cake. And it's called ribbon like stools um, that you'll see with that one. I mean, interception is a little jelly stools with little blood. Hirschsprung's is the ribbon shaped stools. which is a condition that occurs mainly in children where the intestines telescope into itself. <clears throat> and it's called intussusception. Many of the times they'll self come out and we just tell them to increase their diets, but many times they, they do go to surgery. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD, what is that? What does that mean? So this is when the stomach contents goes up the esophagus and it burns and it hurts. And in older children, you hear them coughing because it's trying to get into the, the uh, lungs and that abdominal pain, heartburn is all part of it. It feels horrible. Inflammatory bowel disease involves what? IBS, what is that? From where to where, which one? <clears throat> So it's any part of the intestines. Remember, it's mouth to anus, anywhere in between, inflammatory bowel, IBS. What would the nurse be looking for when a patient has mechal diverticulum? I describe it like a skin tab with a vessel that breaks off and, you know, you're just leaking blood through the intestines and it needs a surgical repair. You need to go in and get that vessel because it will continue bleeding. 
Twisting of the bowel, blocking the lumen of the intestines is called. Whether it's, you know, um, interutero, where it's twisted, you know, with a body organ or a, a vessel, veins, or into itself, it twists into a knot. Remember, these are symptoms that you would see with appendicitis. This one is called volvulus. I've seen one in my career. It was hard to determine what it was, but it was a left upper quadrant. So we kept looking and this kid looked uncomfortable. So um, we did find it and sent the kid to surgery. A school-age child goes to the ER due to abdominal pain and vomiting for the last 24 hours. What assessment is priority? Like what question are you gonna ask first to this child? So I wanna know where that pain is. Is it upper middle chest? Is it right lower quadrant? It will make a difference on how we treat the child. So knowing where the pain is, describe the pain, tell me where it's at. What would the nurse expect to see in an infant with biliary atresia? Remember A means absent. That means there's no connection between the liver and the common bile duct. I mean, what does bile do for the body? So with that, okay, there is no bile being put into the stool, so it's clay colored. You're gonna see tea colored urine too. And then because it cannot digest fat, you're gonna see that abdominal distension on this child. So that's biliary atresia. What structure of the mouth can be impacted by cleft lip and palate? Hard palate, soft palate, lip, one, both, or all of them, yes. What is the most common associated syndrome for cleft palate? The little boy's name was Jackson. He was blonde hair and blue eyed. And as I watched him grow from an infant up to a two year old and watched him grow out of it, but it's called Pierre Robin. Um, it's uh, one of those syndromes that doesn't happen that often, but it has to do with feeding. And then of course the cleft, and he also had the hypospadias, all specific to Pierre Robin. Cleft lip repair is typically done when? Cleft lip is two to three months, okay? Later on is when we do the palate. As in when does the cleft palate repair typically occur? So that's six to 12 months, eight to 12 months, you know, the latter part of your first year. And then they do the palate and they try to get it before the child talks so that there's no real speech impairment. They're still gonna go to speech therapy. Esophageal atresia, what does that mean? I mean, when we look at the words again, esophagus, esophageal, atresia means a without, there's no opening. So esophagus, no opening to the stomach. Very simple, good job. What are the classic signs of esophageal atresia? 
and tracheal esophageal fistula, what would a newborn look like when you didn't suspect this? How would you might say, uh, there's something going on here? And that's when you see that choking, coughing, and then those cyanotic um, moments because they're aspirating into their lungs. Everything's going, you know, into their lungs and making them choke and gag. So how do we treat them? NPO, elevate the head of the bed, suction at the bedside. Neonate with suspected tracheoesophageal fistula, the nursing care should include Again, elevate the head of the bed, NPO, absolutely nothing by mouth. They're just gonna aspirate it in their lungs. There's no connection to their stomach or there's a connection directly to the lungs. You don't feed them. A five-year-old child's complaining of epigastric pain and in a persistent cough. What would you might suspect? And that's GERD, gastroesophageal reflux. It's one of the ways that we can see that with heartburn and abdominal pain, you would see with uh, a child with uh, reflux. Treat it just like adults, start with a Pepsid. Signs and symptoms of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is that little olive mass right underneath the, the siphoid process, actually. And that's that little hypertrophic muscular valve, the pyloric sphincter that you can feel. And you're going to see them projectiling across the room. Literally, your feet will get splat. It's quite impressive. Signs and symptoms of pyloric stenosis. And it is just projectile vomiting. And you know something? They're hungry because they keep losing their food. So poor appetite, no. They'll keep eating, 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 eating because they keep losing their food. They're just hungry, hungry. Kim's back up on top again. What does the celiac disease affect? <laughs> So celiac disease is all about the small intestines, okay? The small intestines and it's that common bile duct and it's what it secretes in there. And the pain that can cause due to diet inappropriate is all the little villi in there that try to absorb all of this nutrient, you know, and it affects them and creates that pain. So small intestines. Large intestines just absorbs more of the fluid, more of the nutrients as it goes. But um, celiac is all about small intestines. If you have celiac disease, what should you eliminate from your diet?
wheat, rye, and barley is what we need to get rid of. So anything that's breaded, you know, your chicken nuggets, fish, you know, fish sticks, uh, any of those things these children can't have unless it says gluten-free. I mean, we're lucky today they have a lot of gluten-free out, out there. You know, when I started nursing and peds, they didn't have those things. A multi-select. Vitamins that children with celiac disease are prone to lose are? And that's A, D, and K, which means all of your fat soluble. Vitamin C is a water soluble, so that one's fine. What foods would you select for a child with celiac disease? <clears throat> Remember what I told you to look at and because of those things, eliminate it. Go to the next one. So anything that has any sort of wheat in it, macaroni and cheese has noodles, pasta, no. When you French toast, it's bread, no. Garlic bread, it's bread, no. So bacon omelet, bacon, a banana and a, a glass of milk are all perfect for this child, okay? That's how you remember, just it says bread in it, no. Phimosis, what is that? So phimosis is when the foreskin on an uncircumcised male is too tight and you can't pull it down. And that of course will lead to urinary tract infections. So most of the time they'll do a circumcision. My grandson had to have it done at a month old. I could not get that thing to go down. So it had to be done. What is a hydrocele? You know, hydrocele's are painful. It's usually what brings attention to them. And treatment's gonna be an antibiotic, but it literally is just fluid around the testes and it irritates. Sometimes in adults or children, um, the male will have an incontinent uh, episode where like, where did that happen from when they're, you know, potty trained? And it's usually why they go for treatment. What is crypto orchidism? This is one of the things I've put in a Kahoot question so that we have it covered. And this has to do with the male child, infant that's born and the testicles don't come down. That's why the pediatrician, you know, checks the hips, make sure they're moving. Then they go to the testicles and feel to make sure they're down. Now, one of the things about examining these children, make sure that it, the room is warm. It's not cold because that will suck up that the testicles and you'll get, you know, an accurate, you know, examination assessment. So make sure it's warm, you know, your hands too, so that you can make sure that those testicles are down. Testicles will die if left up into the abdominal cavity. So they do need to get them brought down, usually within the first year of life. They need to get those brought down. Save the testicle. You suspect an infant for crypto orchidism. How would you examine the infant? <clears throat> Mm -hmm. 
Again, have them in a nice warm room so we know those testicles will be hanging. And Mary J's on fire again. A hypospadias, what is that? Now I've described two, epispadias and hypospadias. Epispadias is on the top side. What is that word? And then hypospadias is on the underside. So there's ventral and dorsal, which one? So hypospadias is on the bottom and that's your ventral side, okay? How do we repair that? With the foreskin, we cover it. Um, and then we'll put a stint in there, leave it there. Um, just make sure that it's in the diaper because it will drain some urine. And then after about a week, the physician or a couple days, the physician will take it out. A multi-select. How is the hypospadias corrected? So surgery is done under general anesthesia. This hurts. And it's a lot of manipulation of the penis. Circumcisions aren't. We know that. In fact, no anesthesia really, except for a pacifier and sugar water for the newborn infant. But they take the foreskin, they cover it, do plastic closure. They put that stint in so that it keeps it open. And then a couple of days later, the urologist will remove it. And Kim's still on fire. What is bladder extrophy? You know that one, Kim. This is when the bladder is born on the outside because of this midline closure thing. And it's during development, you know, inside, you know, your embry em embryonic development. So, you know, while the baby's forming, this occurs. And again, the bladder works. We just got to get it put back in and we need to prevent infection until we get it put back and sealed back up. What are the clinical manifestations of nephrotic syndrome? And remember, nephrotic syndrome is not renal failure. So it's hypoalbuminemia. All the proteins of the body are gone. Low serum albumin, which is basically the same thing as hypoalbuminemia, um, you're going to see um, um, all of your protein in your urine, protein urea. And because of that, all the fluid shifts into the interstitial spaces. Again, how do we treat this? Well, steroids, and then monitor fluid intake, and then uh, salt also. Children with nephrotic syndrome are given what medications for fluid overload? Well, think about again, nephrotic syndrome has to do with not enough protein, not enough albumin inter, you know, intravascularly. And that's what causes the fluids to go out. So how do we replace the protein and get rid of fluid. Absolutely. Give them some albumin, build up the intravascular, give Lasix and push out the urine. Very good. Good job. What is used to treat nephrotic syndrome in children? Prednisone is absolutely what we do, along with monitoring vital signs, fluid balance, INO, and daily weights.
What is the priority nursing care of a child with nephrotic syndrome? Priority. So priority, daily weights, intake output of, of these things. You have only daily weights there. We're going to decrease salt intake and decrease fluid intake. Blood sugars have nothing to do with it. It's all about protein. Why is erythropoietin used in chronic kidney failure? So erythropoietin stimulates the own body to make red blood cells because chronic kidney failure, children and adults both have low hemoglobin hematocrits and it stops the need for more than needed blood transfusions. A multi-select. Children with CKD have renal osteodystrophy. What can this do to the child? Osteo, bone, right? Dystrophy means some abnormality. Has to do with a child with calcium, right? Bones, calcium. We know the thyroid, the parathyroid gland, it works with calcium. So you see high calciums in these children. Because of that, and we... Um, with the calcium too high, you're going to see those skeletons that are going to be, you know, the, the legs aren't going to be formed right. And then, of course, we're going to see growth retardation because the body's not getting exactly what it needs to grow in the proper manner. Osteodystrophy, it's a mouthful. A diagnostic finding of acute glomerulonephritis may be. I'm asking it in a different way. So we know it's from a strep infection, right? So when you look at the positive anti-streptolysin titer or positive ASO titer, it's a positive strep in the body. So that will show you that it's due to the strep infection, which causes the glomerulonephritis. That's another way of asking for it. Not that they've had a recent pharyngitis, but they have a positive ASO titer. What complication of peritoneal dialysis is most important? So you remember that children, when they're on dialysis, means their kidney's not working. So the only kidney they have is their peritoneum. So the thing we're watching out the most is to prevent abdominal peritonitis, or there's nowhere that we can get rid of you know, debris that we need to, because there are no kidneys. We're using the peritoneum. So we're worrying about peritonitis. Which clinical assessment is most important to report with a child diagnosed with an acute kidney trauma? You know, I've seen a little eight or nine year old boy was playing, you know, tag or one of those things and ran around the corner and his back hit a trailer hitch. Came into me and his back right at the level of the kidney had this purple bruising like big. And I know when they drew the lab, I went in and looked and his potassium level was over six. Um, it was so clear that potassium is what you look for with kidney trauma. A multi-select. What should the nurse anticipate for a child who just had a renal biopsy?
So whenever you touch the kidneys, you're gonna worry about output. So intake and output, they need to be on bed rest so that we don't dislodge that whatever is clotted off the area. So urine or blood can't drain within the peritoneal cavity or outwards. And of course, we're watching that dressing just like we do for a cardiac cath to make sure it's not saturated with blood or urine. What would you do if the fluid draining from a peritoneal dialysis has changed color and is now cloudy? So we suspect if it's changed color, something's going on, possibly an infection. As I said, better safe than sorry. Notify the provider, get the antibiotics, start them as soon as we possibly can. And last question. What would the nurse provide to an infant that cannot eat normally? I mean, we've had an esophageal atresia, tracheal esophageal atresia. They can't eat normally. Now we need to promote proper growth and development. What's the one thing we need to do for this child? And we're putting absolutely nothing in that mouth, no drops of anything because they can choke on it. All we're doing is putting a pacifier because how do infants self-soothe? It's biting, chewing, sucking, right? We need to put that pacifier in and to encourage that for once that they can suck, that they already have those muscles built up, they're used to it. Number three, LP. Number two, Mary J, good job, Mary. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Number one, Kim, look at that. I told you you'd do it, good job. So what I'd like you to do is please sign your attendance attestations so you don't forget. I will be working on getting you that assessment assignment, the assignment exam open for you probably tomorrow. Um, well, I have some time to get that done. And remember, send me in your projects. I will tell you if you need something else, especially if you want that great grade, because 6%, I'd be going for it. The professor's telling me I'm going to be there and I'm going to make sure it's done. And I'm not doing crazy expectations. I just want a nice project, something that I know you've learned from. OK, so I see you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anything, let me know. Keep talking Thank to me. You. I don't mind. <laughs>